Let's welcome all of our online community that join us. It's so good to have you with us. And uh, here today, we're going to continue in our breakthrough series. And I want to speak into breakthrough in families. And instantly I could say that, and I look across a wide range of an auditorium, and family could mean something different because uh, basically you could be in different stages. You could be a young adult that's like, man, I'm, I'm not married, I haven't, I haven't got kids. Or you could be at the other end, empty nesters, uh, anything in between that space. But I want to just highlight the fact that we here are a family as a church. And that's the focus I wanna look at today. I think so often we segregate aspects of church and we have glow youth, glow kids, we have our young adults, we have all of these different areas and they all encounter God and we can sometimes segregate it, but we forget the fact that we're a family before we're departments. And, and so um, as a family um, of believers here today, I really wanna unpack uh, some aspects about how, how we can get breakthrough how we can get breakthrough in our life. But to understand what we need to get breakthrough in, probably good to know what we're breaking through. That's what I've been thinking this week. So it's all good to go breakthrough. Well, what are we breaking through? And as I look around, even this week, looking at the news and seeing uh, uh, different things that are happening in the sports or the media world and, and things that are happening all across our world, I've started to look at some aspects of where we need breakthrough. And, and I've, I've narrowed it down to three areas of where society is starting to shift and mindsets change and the way that we're acting and treating one another. And so the first, uh, I think, challenge that we need to break through is that we're seeing a deconstruction of truth. A deconstruction of truth is happening in society right now where my truth becomes truth. And my truth's more important than your truth. And we all start to create our own truth or we start to recreate truth. And if my truth doesn't match up to your truth, then now we're in conflict. Now, this is a problem because what happens is ideas start to become more important than people. And we start to treat people through our truth rather than we see the person. And when this happens, we start to see um, all sorts of side effects of, of brokenness in ourselves, brokenness in relationships. But it all starts where we start to deem our truth, truth. And we're not willing to budge. Judges 21 verse 25, this sums it up quite well. For those days, I think it's for us today, it says, in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. That's a, that's a fitting scripture for today, right? We're starting to see people who are not having God as God. We're, we're, we've repositioned God as being King and we're positioning ourselves as Lord, Lord of our own life. And we start to create or recreate truth and start to live out of this. That's a dangerous place to be. A dangerous place is where we no longer have a truth that guides us, but we create our own truth. And, and, and what happens in worst case is when conflict starts, and at absolute worst case, we start to cancel out others and other people's opinions, other people's views, and we start to become intolerant because of the truth. That's a dangerous place to be. I think it starts to move us into the second problem that I see that we need to break through, which is a disillusionment of our lives. Um, I would sum it up this way with a quote that says, never has any one culture had so much and enjoyed it so little. We have so much. You are sitting in aircon. I don't know if you noticed. It's just lovely temperature. Some will argue too cold. Someone else is like, it's boiling in here, um, whatever it might be. But the truth is we're sitting here in a comfortable seats. We're in a church with a great sound. Beyond that, just go home and you're in the top 5% of wealthy people in the world because you have a refrigerator. If people are on the benefits in Australia receiving um, Centrelink, they're in the top 3% of money earners in the world. So if you're anywhere north of that, you should be thankful for all that you have in your life. We're living with a device, it's an iPhone, and, and, and if you have an iPhone, not an Android, um, you, you really have replaced about 40 different devices. I have no idea why I need a spirit level built into my phone, but if I need a compass, done. I've got it right now. I've got 40 different devices and yet we have all of these things in our world, but I'm unhappy. I've got food. 
I've got a car. If you've got two cars, my gosh, are you like near the top one or 2% of wealthy people in the world? Perspective, right? But we've got a disillusionment that's happening around um, our own life. We're not enjoying what we've got. We're moving through so fast paced, looking for more, wanting more, and aren't able to just stop and go, wow, I ate breakfast. How good's that? Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2 says, everything's meaningless, says the teacher. It's completely meaningless. And this is where people are falling themselves in life. Life's become meaningless. Life's so terrible. It's so hard. And very quickly you see people fall into um, a state of um, mental health challenges. Can I say that thankfulness, gratefulness, it turns it really fast. There's something about this. I, I, I was a little while ago, um, I, was, I was in the offices here and uh, Clay, our worship pastor here, he goes, he goes, I'd just been away on a holiday. And he goes, man, you live a good life, hey. And I stopped and went, I just got back from a family holiday in Fiji. And I went, yeah, yeah, I do live a good life. I had just spent a week laying in the sun. You can tell by my tan. Anyone here last week? Actually, last week I was a little bit offended. Um, we had to do baptisms. And I was both doing the baptisms and I had to come up and introduce and pray with some people. So I came out of my shorts. If you were here, you were blessed. <laughs> but what happened was, I, not one, not two, I must have had about 10 people make comment about my white legs. <laughs> and I had just come back from Fiji. It's terrible. I'm clearly not there tanning or whatever it was. But Clay's like, gee, you live and it was this moment of where I actively had to stop and go, my goodness, I'm almost become so ungrateful that, that our family were, were blessed to go and holiday together and do something incredible right now. And I think this is because the world, it, it has this culture of this disillusionment and we, and we detach. The, the, the last one really, which we get to is a detachment from others. It's because we walk away from God's truth and we make our own truth. And then what we do is we start to not be grateful and thankful. Then we start to detach from other people. We start to detach from relationships. In the UK, um, inquiries about divorce went up 95% during COVID. That's scary because what's happening is relationships are breaking down and this is now just becoming common. Because my truth is my truth and now I'm arguing with your truth, which is your truth. And then we're starting to not be grateful for one another. And then this detachment from relationships, we haven't got people in our world to come, bring us alongside like clay and just point us towards, hey man, you live a pretty good life, right? And what this is, is being in this community. So I think these three aspects are working right now. And who knows, we need breakthrough in this space. If we need breakthrough in our own life, if the world needs breakthrough, it's breakthrough over these areas. And so how do we get this? And this is what I really wanna get to this morning of how do we get to this point? In a recent study I saw, it was how we create spiritual vibrancy. Now this wasn't a Christian study. So these three things were a worldwide survey and study to look into how spiritual vibrancy is created. But when we apply this to the context of Christianity, it makes a whole lot of sense. There's three parts to the puzzle that I wanna bring today and so that we can see breakthrough into these three areas of deconstruction of the truth over disillusionment with our lives and detachment from others. And these three pieces of the puzzle, they look like this. The first is trust in an authoritative text. We call this the Bible. We call this the Bible. We're gonna unpack that in a moment. The second is to have a faith community involvement. You're sitting in it right now. This is called the church. And the third aspect is positive family experiences. Now, I'm sure you would all affirm that this and say that the Bible's important, that church is important, you're all here, so I'm sure you believe that, that this is important. If it's your first time, you're inquiring, you're saying, okay, what is it about a, a group of believers? What is it that they're speaking about? Why is the Bible important? And it brings it together when we can actually live this out in our life at home. 
We started hearing before about legacy, about building as a church for the legacy. Well, what happens when these three come together is we start to build into the next generation and the next generation. And the Bible talks very clearly about God being a generational God. He talks about how we pass it on to our sons or to our children and to our children's children. And so I wanna unpack this today. The first part is trust in an authoritative text. The thing about this, and when we, we hold that up to the fact that we're creating our own truth, is that if you're creating your own truth, you're not putting full trust into the truth, which is the authoritative text. If you're living this space of going, no, I'll create what I mean. The problem is we actually do this with the Bible. We actually start to read the Bible to apply it to the lens of what we need. We're looking at our problems in life. And so we go digging for a scripture that's then gonna give us what we actually want. There's a great scripture in the Old Testament and where one of the prophets is there and wrestling about this. And, uh, and basically they call out to God and God goes, yeah, cool, whatever. They've already decided in their heart. And essentially what he's saying is these people have already decided in their heart whether they can go this way or that way. And then they go to God and say, what should I do? And God goes, eh, whatever, you've already decided. And we live this way. We look for the truth of the Bible to back up the truth that we've already created. That's a dangerous place to be. And so what's important is how we read and appropriate the Bible into our world. So to unpack this a little bit, we have to understand when we're reading it, um, what, which way to read it. And what I mean by that is there's, there's two verb moods. I know your teenager's moody, but now you've got the Bible that's all moody, but you've got this, the mood of the, of the verse or the verb. And, and, and I'll unpack it a little bit now, but it talks about that we've got the indicative mood or we have the imperative mood. The indicative mood is a mood of certainty or actuality. And, and this is used when God is speaking. So God gives what is truth. And then the imperative mood of the verb or the action is where we step in into action out and living this out. This is the process of sanctification. It is, it is and, and Paul writes and talks all about it, even in the book of Galatians, he goes, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? You've gone away from what you first ta were taught and you've gone back to works or law. When we get into a place that we start striving to do, we're missing the fact that God has already done it. And this is what this is. This indicative word is where He has said it. And the imperative is how we then act it out. But we get this around the wrong time, around the wrong way all the time. And we start striving and acting out. I'll, I'll, I'll bring some scriptures up on the screen right now to help unpack this a little bit more. Um, the first scripture that we've got there is where it says, um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, what we do is we read it this way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see the difference here? In fact, we get up and we preach it sometimes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Get your notepads out. We're gonna tell you five ways that you can do all things. And then we set up the message by five ways that you can do all things this week. And by Thursday, you've not done any of them and you're disillusioned with your faith. And you're like, oh my gosh. I, I can't do all things. I, I can't do all things. And, 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 and those five things of, of, of what I should have really straightened my backbone and shot after, I'm not doing. Oh man, I've got to get back to church next Sunday. And, and, and I better get five more things to do. This is what Galatians is talking about. We've gone away from I can do all things through Christ Jesus. That's the picture. All Scripture points to Him. And when we get this indicative and this imperative of nature, we see that it is through Christ Jesus, that's the starting point. And because He is who He is, we can then live out all things for Him and through Him. But when we get this around the wrong way, it starts to bind us up. So if you wanna have a trust in an authoritative text, it's a trust in Christ Jesus. That's who it's all pointing to. 
An Old Testament example, you look at David and Goliath and we all think we're gonna come out here and slay our giant. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that they'd set up an idol of King Saul as being, he's gonna be the deliverer. The people cried out, give us a king in whom we can have as king. And God's like, well, I was your king, but sure, have him. And then in the time of crisis, Goliath comes and where's their king or their God? He's nowhere to be seen, he's hiding in the tent. And David comes and he comes as a picture of killing sin and death, the giant that's in our world. But yet we read that passage and go, I'm gonna slay my giant. No, we can accept Christ. That's the main point right here. And as we put full trust in an authoritative text over our life, we start to appropriate Scripture in the right way. That's just one part of the puzzle. But if you just focus on that, that's a good start. But you're gonna do it in isolation. The second part of the puzzle is talking about doing that within the context of a faith community. This is where the Bible, and this is where the texts start to take shape in our life. Because who knows, we heard, uh, who knows, we've heard about connect groups here and, and we're gonna be speaking a little bit later about how connect groups are relaunching this week. But the context of being in a connect group is so that the Word of God in which we're sitting under an authoritative text can then be brought out in a community and we can start to live with one another, sharpening one another, helping one another through the context. I'm not saying come to my connect group because the Doritos are awesome. They are. Come to my house, we're gonna have bag of lollies, it's gonna be great. Okay, that's good, but I can tell you the transformational moment is when a group of us get together and we open the Word of God and sit under the teaching and going, oh man, this is gonna be helpful. And so what is that? Well, it talks about in 1 Peter 2, 5, it, it reads a little bit different in the NRSV, but I'll read it out. It says, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. It's talking about us coming together to build the house or the temple. Now, the writers of the Bible use this analogy in Peter and Ephesians. It talks about us coming together as stones or living stones. Essentially what this picture is, is the temple that was once built had the large key stone, the cornerstone that the whole temple was built on. This is what we refer to as Christ. He's our cornerstone. It's the key element. I'll just unpack that in point number one, that Christ is the key element and the cornerstone. But then it talks about that all the other stones then start to get built on top of it. Now, in order for these stones to be built on top, they would have had to have the edges knocked off them and they would have had to be shaped in order for them to fit together. I look around this room right now and we're in all sorts of odd shapes, me included, let me tell you right now. But as we come together as one church and especially in community, whether it would be in connect groups or whether it would be serving alongside one another in church, this is the moment where you start to get those edges chipped away and people can hold you accountable to what the Bible says. And they can sit there and they go, and, and it, years ago I'm in church and I'm setting up and I'm, I'm, I'm task focused. Sometimes I just get head down, I'm task focused, I'm doing all this. And one of my friends came to me and said, hey, um, are you okay this morning? I said, I'm fantastic, why? He goes, well, your face doesn't tell it. I'm like, oh, okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, but the truth is you need a friend to come and tell you, you're frowning, you look angry. You're telling everyone that the, you know, the, the joy of the Lord is your strength, but you're not looking joyful this morning. Yeah, you're frowned. Chris always tells me, you're a frown. I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm intent. I'm, I'm there doing this. But the truth is, um, I need people to knock the edges off me. I had someone come and correct me the other night after the service. I walked past them, I said hello to someone and someone else came back home and said, hey, sometimes you come and you don't notice me or say hello. I'm so grateful that we're in a house that we can be comfortable enough to talk to one another and actually correct and say, and, and I was, I am so sorry, you're right. I get so task focused sometimes that I can walk past people. I don't wanna be that guy. And I'm so grateful that someone would feel that we're in a safe enough house that we can talk to one another. This is what it talks about when we're in this space because it talks about in Peter and Ephesians about building as living stones coming together. You know, next month we've got uh, November rain. 
And I know that we're believing for the Holy Spirit to move and for God to move and miracles to take place, but it can happen in October as well. And I can tell you what will cause the Holy Spirit to move may not just be Mike's drum you know, crash or his build up. It, it, it helps, it's number two to what I'm about to say. It, theologically, number two. Number one though, it talks about where the living stones come together, that's where the presence of God is. If you want the presence of God to move in your house, it's not turning up at November rain and standing at the front. It's about turning up at church and going, I'm in a connect group. It's about turning up and saying, I'm serving on team. Because that's you as a living stone. Because when I look out across the church, there is a a U-shaped stone that is missing in some of the areas of our service teams or connect groups. Now, we don't need you, please hear my heart, but you need it. You need to be shaped in a manner in which the presence of God can then move in your life. And it's done scripturally by us being living stones and coming together. And as we look, being in this faith community under the Word of God is the second element that is gonna build this spiritual vibrancy. This is how we're gonna get breakthrough in our life. We're gonna allow the Word of God to change us. We're gonna let the Holy Spirit to come and move because we're in unity with one another as living stones. And then the third aspect is we take it into our homes. This is where it can get challenging. This is where when I look, I get challenged. I'm a dad first and foremost, and I get challenged. There's some percentages that will come up on the screen behind me and it starts to unpack how faith is outworked in our homes. And this this can be alarming. If you're a mathematician, and now you're gonna look for it, I was told that the percentages don't all add up. I went to school to eat lunch and play rugby. Let that just be known, right? No, I think it's missing by a couple of percent and it must be point something. And anyway, I I rounded up or rounded down. Anyway, it's close enough. Um, Now you're looking for it. I shouldn't have said it because now you're not gonna listen to what I have to say and you're not gonna focus. Everyone's doing a quick maths. Who's found it? Has anyone found it? Yeah, good, good. Here we go. Pray with children. Hear the point rather than uh, uh, do the maths. But right now we're seeing... 49% of people who rarely or occasionally pray with their children at home. Let that be alarming enough, despite me being on my maths out by 1%. That's alarming. When we have a look at it, there's only 35% who are doing it several times a week or daily. 65% of people are not praying with their children daily or even weekly. This is where we have separated and isolated these three elements. What we do is we go, no, no, I've got the Bible, it's all good. I I can read the Bible, I can be a Christian, but I don't need to be in a faith community. Okay, you can, but I know what's gonna be better for you. I know where the Holy Spirit's gonna reside, it's when we're as living stones. Or you can come to church and not even read the Bible. You can come to church and not even have the Bible as an authoritative text. You just like the community and the coffee. Coffee's good, I agree. But you can just come and and miss the Word of God or you can do the first two and not take it home and it's not gonna shape your world for generations to come. I look at this one, pray with your spouse. Like if we just, 52% just not praying. The, The divorce rate, it says literally flips in percentage if you just pray daily with your spouse. We have a look here, talk about spiritual values with kids or have family devotion time. Now I'm just gonna hit pause before I go on and just focus to the parents in the room right now. If you're not, then, then the rest applies, but this is one point. We as a church are committed to not just being someone who speaks about this, but also create resources to help you. Behind me, you'll see one that we're, we have created. It's called uh, Parent Q. Actually, we didn't create it. We're adopting this and integrating it into our program. It's called Parent Q. You can download this app called Parent Q, the app. In fact, this week on our social media, we've done a video on how to access this and, and, and work it through. We'll put it up again so you know. But if you're a parent, download the app, Parent Q. You set up an account. You then find your church via the postcode here in Rabina. And then instantly you will have access for your children in each of the age and stage that they're in in order to have devotions, in order to have a short video as to what they learn. What they're learning right now in Sunday, tomorrow will be available on the app for you to be able to do devotions with your kids. It is amazing, we just have to now use it. 
So we've got these great resources, but, but we have to take it from home. Let me tell you why it's important to do this at home. If I've got one little uh, emblem that comes up here, it represents one hour. This is how often or how much influence we as a church have. I, I love that COVID has reignited the fact that parents are acutely aware that we are responsible for the faith formation of our children. Prior to COVID, and I've been a kids pastor for over 20 years, I would say we landed in a place in church and where we subcontracted the faith formation out to the church. We thought we were doing a good job by turning up every fortnight and signing them into kids. And, and, and that's probably a good start, but it's not gonna be optimal. Let me tell you why, because if that's one hour, the church has 40 hours a year to influence your child. Now we wanna come alongside, we wanna create resources, we wanna help you. But in contrast to 40 hours, us as parents have 3000 hours of influence. Now this would go true with you as a young adult in your connect group. You can turn up to church for one hour a week on average, 40 hours a year. But if you get into a connect group, if you get around your friends, it's thousands of hours of influence of where we can be shaped and moulded together and sit under the Word of God together. And so how do we bring this whole puzzle together? Let me get the band back out and I'm gonna demonstrate this to help you understand just how we bring these three bits together. Because the truth is, I said it before, you can have the Bible, just read the Bible and that's good. There's people all around the world that would just read the Bible in isolation but it's not transforming their life or they're not living out their best as to what God called them to be. There's people I know that come to church purely because they're lonely and they just wanna be connected in. And that's a good start, but not allowing the Word of God to be the authoritative text. You're still living in that place where your truth is the truth. And that's not gonna help either. When we take that home, we get this mix of just filling a rejection void or over on, community side or we've got our own truth that's still coming out, we're not instilling something into the future generations. And so I'll illustrate it this way, that the Bible purely read on its own just sounds like the drums. And so you've got the Bible and that's good. I can listen to that. I can see the people start to just nod their head. They're like, that's good. I listen to it for a while. I'm not a muso, but I go, oh, that's good. But I do know one thing. If we get the Word of God and we integrate that in with a faith community, we start to get, the bass starts to kick in. Oh yeah, as soon as the bass starts. And what we've got now, we've now got the Word of God and a faith community that are coming together. And that's good. But who knows if we add the next part of when it comes into home, this is what we get. Nothing screams spiritual vibrancy like my Sharona. Awesome guys. Uh, Put our hands together for these guys. Every time you listen to my Sharona now, you're gonna think spiritual vibrancy. Am I discipling my child? (laughs) Have I been in church? My Sharona, am I in a connect group? (laughs) You know what, that's my hope. (laughs) My hope this morning that you can see that in isolation, one of these parts is good. The electric guitar on its own is great. You know, I grew up in a home that was brilliant. I've got a great, a great picture of a heavenly father because of my dad. He never missed a rugby game, even right through my 20s and 30s. He was there flying all around and didn't miss a game. And I love my dad and he gave me a great picture of a heavenly father, but I grew up not knowing the Word of God. I grew up not in a faith community. And at 15, I entered a faith community as well as having a good home, but having the Word of God that shaped my life, that was the moment in when I stopped creating my own truth, my own worldview, and I surrendered my life for Him to be Lord. And it's from that point on 
that when these three are working together, I've started to see my life grow. The spiritual vibrancy exceed and excel. And I land in a place where I'm able to live out all that God created me to be. I look across this room of living stones, just such potential in this place, but many people selling themselves short of all that God created you to be. God's created you to be brilliant. God's created you to be creative in so many areas. And you just will never reach that full potential, perhaps unless you get alongside someone in a context of a connect group or a Sunday to call that out in you. Can we just pause in this moment and maybe reflect where one of these three areas we may not have prioritised. We may not have the Word of God as that authoritative text. Maybe we've drifted away from being in a connect group or even serving on team here to allow God to outwork all that He has in your life. Or maybe there's some aspects at home that you can you can just align. If that's you, why don't you just lift your hand in this place? I'm just gonna pray right now. God, across this whole place, we thank You that we can just do better. That God, that through Your help, through Your love, through Your guidance, God, we can just remove ourselves. That we can remove ourselves and just put You firmly as the priority. So God, we just ask right now that You help us put the Word of God as that authoritative text. We ask God that You would help us be the living stones by being in community. And we ask right now that You help us to take this into our homes so that the generations to come will know You, will love You, will serve You in Jesus' mighty Name. Amen, amen.